Welcome to AP Statistics. In this video, we're going to talk about histograms and how we could use them to really help us explore quantitative data. Now, I don't want to talk too much on this topic, but histograms are kind of my personal favorite ways of displaying quantitative data. Now, I don't want to, I want to be impartial here, but they really are the best, and you will see tons of them throughout the AP tests. So let's talk about what a histogram is. So first, they do look like bar graphs, but they are not. Please keep in mind, bar graphs are only for categorical data so if you see bars that represent how many people like blue or how many people have blonde hair or how many people said yes they're gonna vote for this or no they're not gonna vote for that that's called a bar graph but the moment the bars represent counts of data that's quantitative that's where we have what's called a histogram so a lot of people call them bar graphs but they're not they're called histograms so they're best for continuous variables but they can be used for discrete as well but they're really best for continuous um, quantitative variables. Now, histograms are first created from frequency tables. So you typically need to have a frequency table first in order to build a histogram. So let's talk about what a frequency table is. So first, you need to identify your min and your max. Okay. Then from there, you have to decide on an interval length that divides up the data into several intervals or bins, bins of data. So for example, if I measure the heights of 120 trees in feet, so I get my minimum and my maximum, and then from there I have to decide, okay, I want to separate that spread, that distance, into intervals. And I know I don't want just two intervals because that's only two bars, it's too small. So I need to have a couple intervals. So I decide, you know, how do I want to, how do I want to break up? Let's go by 50s, right? 100 to 150, 150 to 200, 200 to 250, 250 to 300, 300 to 350. Could do more bins, but maybe less, you don't typically want to do less than five, okay? Now, then what you're going to do is you're going to look at your data, and you're going to count the number of data values that fall into each interval. So you're going to go through a huge list of all of your 120 trees, and you're going to say, okay, how many of those trees have a height from 100 to 150? And I counted three of them. Then you're going to go through how many of those trees have a count, or how many of the trees have a height of 150 to 200, and I counted 30 of them, and so forth. Now, another important characteristic is that these bins are what we call left-handed, meaning that we equal the value on the left, and we go up to, but not equal to, the value on the right. So this first bin is for any tree that starts at 100 feet and goes up to 149.9999999999. The moment we get a tree that's 150 feet, it would go into the next bin. So we call them left-handed bins. Now, then you want to do, once you have your frequency table created, you counted how many trees fall into each bin, then you want to create a number line broken up by your intervals, and then you make bars that show the height for the frequency that go into each bin. So here is a picture of this table that I just made. So this is a frequency table. Okay, so imagine, remember a frequency table for categorical data. We say, okay, so we don't have bins, we just have colors, like red Skittles, green Skittles, orange Skittles, and then we count how many Skittles are of that color. Well, this is very similar to that, but we're, since it's quantitative data, we're breaking up the data into intervals, or what, again, what I call bins. And then you simply make bars that show how high each bin is. So here is the histogram of what I just made. So you'll see there are three trees from 100 to 150, so I made that little bar go up to three. 30 trees well, from 150 to 200, 26, 15, 11. You see it. So on the left, we have the frequency, which is the counts, the number of in each bin. So if you only have this, you don't have all the data, maybe I'm writing a newspaper article or something, and this is what I post, you know that there are 30 trees from 150 feet up to 200 feet but you don't know what they actually are. So if you don't have the actual data in front of you, all you know is, okay, great, there are 30 trees in that bin. They could all be 185 feet, or there could be like a 151, a 152, a 160, a 165, a 172, as long as they fall in that interval, or again, what I call bins. So again, remember, the reason why I call them bins is because, you know, you think about, you, you set up these bins. And all the bins have to be equal in size. I chose all the bins to be 50. And then you take your data and you throw your data into the appropriate bin. Oh, here's a tree that's 260 feet tall. It goes into that bin. Here's another tree that's only 120 feet tall. It goes into that bin. You get the idea of why I call them bins. Now, I want to show you what happens if we make the intervals bigger or smaller. So here's a couple more histograms of the exact same data. Top left here we have smaller bins. The, well, 
the bins are wider, which makes less of them, right? So the bins go by 100. So now we only have three bins, interval of 100. On the right here, we have more bins, the interval is 40. And on the bottom here, we have even more bins with an interval of 20. Now there's no rule to how many bins or how many intervals you have to have, but sometimes just kind of a rule of thumb, usually four or less is kind of too small. And if you get too many, in fact, here is one with tons of bins. Again, really small to see here, but if you can squeeze your eyes in there, each bin here is only five. So first off, we see a lot of empty bins. So if you zoom in there, for example, right here, we see that there are no trees from one, excuse me, from 205, excuse me, I said that wrong again, from 200 to 205. That's an empty bin, just means no trees fell in there. And this isn't bad looking, it just might be too many bins. So, I mean, there's no perfect answer to how many intervals or bins you want to create. It all works, I mean, no one's going to mark it wrong, but it's all about making sure that you represent your data well. So these are all ways to make histograms, but a histogram really starts with making that frequency table. Now here's the good news. I have never seen an AP test where they ask you to make a histogram. Usually, they give you a histogram and they want you to talk about it, right? How do you talk about a histogram? You describe the distribution. And what what does that mean? Talking about what values your variable takes on. Hey, the trees range from 100 to 350 feet tall. And they talk about what are the most common. Well, you know, if I look at this top right histogram, we'd say, oh, a lot of trees were from 260 to 300 feet. That was what was most common. And then you got to, of course, give your center. So maybe we'd say, I don't know, somewhere around 250 is a very common height of a tree in this sample. And then you also want to talk about the shape, of course. Now, that's where the number of bins can actually kind of change your shape. Um, this one right here looks unimodal, meaning that there's this one mode, this one bin that's the, the biggest of them all. Well, let's call that single peaked, if that makes sense. And other than that, you could say it's roughly symmetric, whereas when I add more bins, it actually kind of looks skewed to the left, where there's less trees down here, more trees to the right, that'd be called skewed left. But with only three bins, you'd probably say, oh boy, that's just kind of symmetric, right? It's, it's not perfect, but it's kind of symmetric. So the number of bins can potentially change the shape depending how it is. And that's why you don't want to stick with too few or too many bins. All right, now we can also make a relative frequency histogram. So instead of the bar height showing the counts, it shows the proportion of total data that fall into that bin. We saw this with categorical data as well. You could have relative bar graphs. Well, same thing here. We could have relative histograms. So here's an example of that. In this situation, we ask people how much money they spent the last time they went to a convenience store. So here my bins go by $10, so we have 1 to 10, and then the next one picks up right after 10, 11 to 20. Notice a little bit different way of labeling the bins, but you get the idea. The bins are all equal in size. And then again, notice here we have the relative frequency. So we know that 30% of customers surveyed spent 1 to $10. Here, we'd estimate maybe 32-ish percent spent between 11 and $20. So again, it's just a different way to show the histogram. And remember, one of the, the negative things here is that if you don't know the total number of people surveyed, we don't know how many people fell into each bin. We know that 32% of people are in that bin, but we don't know, we, well, there's actually two things we don't know. We don't know how many that is, we just know it's 32% of them. And we also don't know what their actual numbers were. We just know Know that 32% of people spent somewhere between $11 and $20. That could be a couple $12, a couple $15, maybe $13.20, and $19.40. You know, that's another one of the drawbacks of a histogram is you don't know the actual values, you just know how many or what percent fall into each interval. But again, still very useful ways of seeing the distribution. So I see that many more people spent less than $20. Very few people spent more than $20. So this is definitely skewed to the right. Less numbers on the right, more values on the left. That's going to be a skewed right shape. The center's probably around $15 maybe. $15 would be a typical amount of money that somebody spends at the convenience store. And then the spread is you know, kind of large, it goes from 150, so the overall spread might be large, but realistically, we have over 60% from a one to $20, right? So it might be useful when you talk about spread to not just give the overall spread, but to show where that big chunk is. So you might say something like the overall spread is from $1 to $50, but a huge chunk, over 60% of the customers were spending below $20. All right, let's take a look at a couple more examples of histograms. 
Here's one where we looked at 26 monkeys, and maybe we were doing an experiment or something, who knows, but they had to complete a maze, and below is the time in minutes it took each monkey to complete the maze. Now, notice my bins go 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, but notice that there's a little break in here, so that's actually going to be 10. So what happens is we just didn't label every tick mark. Maybe we should have, but it's, you know, I don't want to say they're trying to trick you, but just watch out for that. So my bins are actually 10 minutes in length. So again, six monkeys took zero to 10 minutes to complete the maze. And don't forget, these are left-handed bins. So that'd be zero up to 10. So if a monkey took nine minutes and 59 seconds, it would fall into this bin. If it took 10 minutes, it would fall into this bin. Now notice that they actually labeled how many fall into each bin. Don't have to do that, but that's kind of a cool feature that they actually label so you don't have to kind of estimate. Oh, oh is that four, is that three? Well, we know it's four because they labeled it. Kind of a nice feature there. All right, let's take a look at another. Oh, let's talk about shape real quick. My goodness, skewed right. Most of monkeys took under 20 minutes. Very few monkeys took an extremely long amount of time, but we see that skewed right distribution, not symmetric. Typical time would probably be around 20, 25 minutes would be a pretty typical time, the, the usual time for the center there that it took the monkeys to finish. And again, the spread, this is a great example of what I was just talking about in the last one. The spread is from zero to 100 minutes, but most monkeys took zero to 30 minutes. That's where the bulk of the monkeys took. So yes, overall, look spread out, but realistically, the majority of the monkeys were kind of there in that zero to 30 minute range. All right, here's another one. So um, from the many houses for sale by a real estate agent, a sample was taken. In each house, the size of the family room was measured in square feet. So we see, for example, three family rooms or three houses had family rooms that were 100 to 150 square feet. Um, another three were over here from 300 to 350 feet in a square feet. So again, pretty cool, simple histogram shows the number of houses. But once again, I want to emphasize, what do we not know? Well, we know six houses fell in this bin, but we don't know what the actual square footage was. There could have been a 180, a 181, a 185, um, a 190. I mean, we just don't know a ton of the individual details, but that's not the purpose of a histogram. It's the purpose is to give us that quick rundown of the distribution. So what would I say about this distribution? Well, I would say the center is probably around 225 square feet. Definitely a good center there. Uh, the spread is from 100 to 350 square feet. The shape is bimodal, right? Bimodal. Why do I call it bimodal? Bi means two. So I kind of see these two big humps of data, two clear peaks in the uh, data, right? That's going to be bimodal. Um, and this also would be symmetric. It's kind of symmetric in a weird way, but if I put a dotted line right down the middle, the, if I fold it in half, the two sides would almost kind of match up, and that's what we mean when we say it's symmetric. So it's symmetric in a weird way, but it's still symmetric in terms of what that means. Um, one more comment on that bimodal. Uh, bimodal is when you see two clear separate peaks in data. So that'd be where you see a peak, and then like a, a valley, and then another peak, right? But if you see like a bunch of data, a bunch of data, a bunch of data, a bunch of data, and the data is all kind of clumped up, that's not bimodal. That's one single peak being formed in the middle. So think about mountain ranges, right? Do you see one peak or do you see multiple peaks? Here's another example. Now, this one's kind of unique because of this. So first, let me explain what this is. So we looked at several rental properties and we examined the cost per month of the rent for each rental property. Now, notice what's different here is we actually don't have bins. We just have little marks for 1,600. This would be 1,800, 2,000, 2,200. So when you see that little tick mark in the middle, that means that this was probably discrete data where the data wasn't arranged. So this, this one property right here was actually exactly $1,600 a month. We don't have a range there. We just have a single value. And uh, for example, right here, this would be 38. Two properties were $3,800 a month. Here we had 10 properties that were $2,900 a month or I'm sorry, that would be $3,000 a month, sorry. So you get the idea, a little slightly different way of labeling the x-axis down there, but it works, especially when the data is discrete and we don't have ranges of data. But again, what shape do we see here? Probably skewed right, most of the data is down here below $3,000, very little data is, the, the data at the right is more spread out and it's less, so we see that skewed to the right, more data on the left, less data on the right. We would probably call this bimodal we do see two kind of peaks here around $2,400 and around $3,000. If I had to give a typical per month cost of all of these properties, 
I don't know, I'd probably say around $2,500. $2,500 would be a good kind of middle ground for all of this data. Now, talking about the spread, again, same thing I was mentioning earlier. The data looks very spread out, as low as $1,600 to as high as $5,200. But realistically, the majority, the large majority of properties were right around here from two to $3,000. So when you talk about spread, don't be afraid to give the overall spread, but then to kind of say where that big chunk of data is located as well. All right, let's look here at, I believe we'll get just a couple more here, but here's one where a waiter examined each tip he got over the course of a week. So every time the waiter got a tip from one of his um, you know, patrons, he wrote down how much he got. So for example, again, notice the tick marks. We skipped some here, so this would be $2.50. This would be $7.50, $12.50, and so forth to get the idea. So 25 tips were from zero to $2.50. So either had a lot of bad tippers or maybe the price of the meals aren't very expensive so people don't feel the tip a lot. But again, I want to emphasize a couple things one more time. 25 people gave a tip from $0 to $2.50. What were those actual tips? We don't know. But we do know that there were 25 tips in that interval. Definitely skewed right. Large majority of the data, well over half, almost 80% of the data is well below five, or not well, but below five dollars. But we do see some data spread out here, so definitely skewed right. This tip that was over twenty dollars might be considered an outlier. We're going to define that a little bit later on, but could be considered an outlier because there's a big gap between it and the rest of the data. If I had to give a typical price, you know, hey, hey, John, what was the typical tip you made? I don't know, $2.50. Even though it's way to the left, that's what the majority of data is. So saying $2.50 or maybe even $3 is a typical tip, that is not um, unlikely at all. Again, talking about that spread, zero to 20 some dollars is the spread for tips, that's kind of large. But again, the majority of it is from zero to $5. So talk about the center, talk about the shape, talk about the spread. And if you see an outlier because of a big gap between some data points, then go ahead and call it out for being an outlier. All right, that's it for histograms. They are my favorite way of representing quantitative data. And they're my favorite way for a reason. That's because you see tons of these. If you open up an AP stats exam, you're probably going to see five to six histograms throughout there somewhere. So make sure you know how to talk about them, make sure you know how to analyze them, and make sure you know what those bars represent, whether it be the counts of data in each interval or the percentage of data in each interval if it's a relative histogram. All right, see you in the next video.